We're very excited. I know there's probably still going to be a few people that are moving to their workshop that they're heading to now. Um, my name is Gay Stevenson, and myself and Tina Schertz, my colleague, we co-coordinate uh, the pop-up shop project in partnership with the Danforth East Community Association. So what we'd like to do, and tell me when I'm the right amount away. Is this better? Be close? OK. Um, it sounds so loud to me. <laughs> um, so what we'd like to do is very quickly go through the project of pop-up shops and the amazing work that DECA has done on Danforth East. And then we'd like to save most of our presentation time for sharing, you some of, sharing with you some of the things that we've learned. And then the final half of our presentation, we're turning it over to you so you can ask us questions. Because I think that's probably what you'll be most interested in doing. So the Danforth East Community Association is an amazing group, and I feel like I should get them to come up and tell you about themselves. But they got together and created the organization in 2007. Unlike any other residence association I've ever heard of, they got together to create something better, to make a good neighborhood to live in, to make it more vibrant, walkable, and safe. They did not get together to fight against something, and that's been their philosophy throughout the whole process of all the work they do. So they're located on, on Danforth, sort of just east of Monarch Park, which is Coxwell, all the way over to Woodbine. Maine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I meant to say Maine. Lucky, lucky, I've got someone. So, the F DECA is an amazing group, and they have uh, created a farmer's market, an arts fair, a pumpkin walk, a visioning committee all kinds of things. So there's a lot of work going on in the neighborhood with the residents already to try to make a vibrant place to live. We just wanted to let you know right at the beginning that we have a pop-up shop toolkit available and we're also going to be making a draw. You can download it for free from our website. So if you are worried about forgetting anything that we say, um, everything is included in there. So now we want to take you back to 2012, um, back when Marcus Westbury came to visit Toronto, and Decca was lucky enough to get him to come and talk to them. Marcus Westbury is the founder of Renew Newcastle in Australia, where he renewed an entire town by bringing artists um, and makers to fill empty storefronts. And so he came and inspired uh, DECA in February, um, and at that time, about one in five storefronts along the Danforth was em were empty. And I, we just wanted to give you a sense of what that looked like. So the pop-up shop project was an idea to fill those empty spaces with some vibrant, inviting businesses. And the objective was for us to increase the foot traffic along the Danforth, get people out, get the streets to feel safe, and to ha invite you know, beautiful, fabulous businesses to open up in some of our storefronts. So the first thing that we needed to do was to identify the empty stores, and we did that through a storefront survey with volunteers, hundreds of, vol uh, over a hundred volunteers have been involved in this project, going along and talking to all the different people in the stores, trying to find out who the owner is, what the business was, and making a list and keeping, uh, keeping track of that. And once we had a list of the stores that were available, 
an empty, we went, we had people that would try to contact the owners and try to convince them to let a temporary business come in and pop up because we would say to them, we have volunteers who will come and make your space more beautiful, we'll clean it, we'll paint it, and then we have volunteers that will advertise for a fabulous new business to come and stay in this store and try their business out here. What we need you to do as the owner is to give us a, a better rate, a deeply discounted rate, and give us a certain amount of time that we can allow that store to pop up whether it's one month or three months or six months. And as soon as we were able to get, begin to get some landlords to say yes to that, which is probably the most difficult part, which we'll want to talk about later on, um, we would bring in the volunteers. And as you can see, they did just about everything to make this spaces work. In one case, we even had to fill a hole in the floor. And then the next step was to seek entrepreneurs to fill out those spaces. So we had volunteers that were advertising online, on Craigslist, in all over places to see whether or not we could attract some pop-up tenants to come into our neighborhood. And I think the very first round we had almost 100 people apply. As soon as we've got a business, and they're set up and ready to go, then we start to spread the word about what that business is, what they have to offer our community, and we try to get people out. We included in that, we, we try to tell the media, and we're lucky that we have a lot of people uh, within the DECA board that are great communicators and have connections with the media so that we can invite tell people about it even bigger than just our neighborhood. So, um, so we, since the project started in 2012, it started about three years ago this time of the year actually, so we've had, since that time, we've had 29 pop-up shops open. Um, 12 stores have been leased on a more permanent basis. Six new businesses have been incubated, so some of our pop-up tenants have converted and stayed and in, in, um, signed long-term leases with the property owners, so that's, those are them, six of them. Uh, two of those businesses actually most recently were, um, were named Best Of by Now Magazine um, just recently, so that's pretty exciting for us that a, a business that started as a pop-up has has established itself enough in the neighborhood to, to get that standing. And then um, we've seen, so when, when the project started, we were at a 17% vacancy rate. Um, a year and a half later, it was measured again at 9%. I think it's safe to say now, probably it's even a little, it's even lower than that. Um, there are more and more businesses moving in. So that's been great. So we've sort of reduced that process to sort of a five-step process for your benefit here, but the reality of it is, is it's pretty involved to get something like this going. So of course it's not without its own challenges, or, um, and we've learned a lot as we've gone through it. So like Gay mentioned before, we do have a toolkit that's available um, and a bunch of also, uh, resources also that are available for download, so we encourage you to come and grab a, a, a card with all that information on it if you're interested. So let's dive into what some of the, uh, what we saw. So, so certainly since we started with the project, um, we, would, uh, we would call up property owners and say, we want to do this pop-up shop project and we'd have to start at square one. They didn't even know what a pop-up shop was. Um, since, since that, it's certainly much more normal. Um, they, when you talk to them, they know what you're talking about often, more recently when you, when you call them. Um, and I think what speaks to a lot of this, last night uh, on Twitter, we had a Twitter chat with Marcus. We, we roped Marcus Westbury into ha hosting a Twitter chat with us. So it was like 7 o'clock in the morning his time and 7, 7 p.m. here. And um, he's in Australia. And one of the big things that he said during it was that an empty space is an incubation space, not a space to be left rotting. And I think that sort of speaks to 
really the, the fabric of what this project is trying to achieve. Um, let's really rethink why space is empty, and, and if it's empty, let's, let's, let's turn that on its head and, and not have it empty. Um, there's huge opportunity there, so let's, let's use that to our advantage. Um, certainly within the project, we were um, seeing that the smaller spaces were what the, were, I'm seeing people nodding their heads, yeah, the smaller spaces were what people were gravitating towards if they were just starting a business. So when we say smaller spaces, we're talking about spaces under 800 square feet. Um, so what often happens when, when new development comes in are the spaces are, that, are, are much bigger than that. Um, so we, we've really, that's something we've identified. On our strip, we certainly have, we have a range, um, but certainly the bigger spaces have been harder for us to, to see leased on a long-term basis. So that's, that's certainly a challenge. Um, and of our businesses that, of the six businesses that have stayed and, and signed a permanent lease, they signed leases in, in spaces that were, 80% of them signed leases that were under 800, 800 square feet or less. You want to talk about Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> so we just wanted to show you some shots of some of the successes. And this is uh, Len, Democratic Purveyors of Fine Art and Beautiful Things. And they are one Nile magazine for the second year in a row, uh, best of design stores in Toronto. Their shop is about 400 square feet. And it's beautiful. and. Whenever you need a gift, you go there and you find it. This is um, Christina, and this is a beautiful secondhand woman's clothing boutique. Her and her partner Colleen have a business called In This Closet, and their store is about 700 square feet. And they've been they've celebrated their second anniversary on our street uh, about in June last year. This is one of our newest pop-up shops. She's already graduated and leased her own permanent store. Um, and her shop is about 800 square feet. Her name is Maggie, and her business is the Handwork Department. This is Marilee Marilee. She's a second-hand children's clothing store, and they also sell toys and books second-hand. They have some artisan new things that are made locally, generally, in the neighborhood. And I should have said that about Crystal uh, of Len. They have a lot of local artists' work for sale in their store. And I know that some of our uh, local artists, for example, we have a woman that makes beautiful cards. She would say that they gave her the opportunity to run her business, which is now doing really well. So, what kind of businesses pop up along the Danforth? The biggest percentage has been clothing um, and jewelry and artisan type businesses. Uh, housewares, we, we collect all of those into one and say about 67% of our businesses were that. 17% were fitness related or activity based. Our very newest pop-up shop is an adventure game and it's our first ever pop-up shop in a basement because it doesn't need the retail frontage because it's one of those escape games where you go and you are locked into a room and you have to solve a puzzle for an hour. <laughs> and 12% of our businesses, when we first started, were a lot more galleries, art galleries and photography. And they're really cool because people bring uh, people from all different parts of the neighborhood and other neighborhoods beyond ours to come and see those. The same with the escape game, which is like a destination store as well. Only 4% food related, in fact that equates to one business because it's very difficult for uh, all the licensing and permits that you need from the city to just pop up. This store was a bakery for six months and um, they were just trying a second location uh, in the east end as opposed to the west. So they were able to bake off location and sell pre-made things. 
This is a, another quote we have from Marcus Westbury because I think he, it sort of epitomizes what we're trying to do in this project. It's not really about certainty, it's about being able to experiment and to give people the opportunity. So what we're trying to do is provide a very low cost way for people who have a brilliant idea or make some kind of lovely art to actually open their own business for a short time, maybe, um, and try out that idea. But if it works, we hope that they'll be able to stay in our neighborhood. One of the things that we found is the landlords prefer us to place pop-up tenants that are actually hoping to stay long term because for them that's what they're looking for. They want their places filled. The same for people who live in the neighborhood. They come out, they enjoy these beautiful shops and they ask us all the time, oh, how long will it be here for? You know, we just, we love it so much. And so they're always rooting too for these shops to be able to stay. We just, we've discovered that if we can give a small business a six month time as a pop-up shop at a lower rate than their regular rent would be, that's the best incubation period we can give them. Um, that will allow them to you know, really suss out the market, figure out what products people are buying and what are the best days to open, what hours they need to be open. Um, but on the other hand, We've also found that people usually know whether the business is going to be a success within the first month. They can tell. It happens very quickly that you get a sense of whether this is going to work out or not. So certainly in working with the entrepreneurs, we've seen that, or we've observed that you to be an entrepreneur, you need a wide range of skills, okay? This includes, you have to be able to do your accounting, you have to be able to do your marketing, you have to be able to do your window dressing to make your, your space look really nice, the merchandising to how you lay your product. Um, all of that is, is part of what contributes to whether, whether um, a business is successful or not, and so, We've tried to support our, the entrepreneurs where if, if they've been lacking in certain of those skills, so we really try and, and help them through. Um, so that's just been part of, of how we've been working as a project. And then what we've discovered and learned too is that an online presence is key. Um, regardless of if you've got a bricks and mortar setting, um, being online is is very, very important to drawing in other people from maybe a little bit further afield who might not be just walking by. Uh, in our particular area, we don't have a whole lot of foot traffic. So having a strong online presence also really helps to generate that, that foot traffic. Um, everyone, all the successful businesses that have stayed long term um, had have either built up their following online. They found, they found the platform that really works for them, that, that connects with their, uh, their customers. Um, some of them too have, say, were online exclusively to begin with, and so then they've opened up um, the uh, bricks and mortars to have their own store space. So it's been, it's been interesting. One of, one of our retailers in particular, she, she's told us that she sells, she's the resale, the women's resale clothing. She can't sell a high-end product, a product that might command a really high price with someone walking into the store. So the, the best way for her to, to get the price that, that, the, that, that the product is worth is for her to put it online. And in those situations, she gets, she can get that price. So that also really can really help drive their sales, which uh, is really important. So a big part of what we've also been doing in the project has just been really pushing and supporting um, the local business and getting the local residents to support the local businesses as well. We've done a shop local campaign uh, this past, when, did, when was Danforth Gems? May? Spring. spring. It was the spring, yeah. So we did a Danforth Gems uh, where local residents were able to nominate their hidden gem in the neighborhood. Um, and any, and um, then there was a prize pack of services that were donated by local residents. It included web, web design, it included uh, a store makeover. All of that 
was donated by professionals in that field. Even some of the local businesses who you know, may have been nominated but then weren't in the final four even donated um, product to help with the makeover in the end. So it, was, it really built a huge sense of community and I think that that's what these shop local initiatives really help to do is really in, builds the community between the residents and the businesses um, but we even saw it building the community be between the businesses themselves which we, we couldn't have expected that that was going to happen when we undertook that project. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that to say that I don't think that we, Tina and I, can really describe what our neighborhood is like. And looking out in the audience here, and I see three of the DECA volunteer board members here. One of them is the person who designed all these beautiful posters that we use. That's part of the volunteer expertise that goes into it. One of them is on the visioning committee, and one of them sort of spearheaded the whole Danforth Gems project. We get such an amazing amazing um, support for the project from the neighborhood. It's, it, is the na it belongs to the neighborhood. It's the neighborhood's project. The neighborhood comes out to support all these stores. DECA puts the call out for all the new businesses that open along the Danforth, and people come and shop at them. And I think people are so excited about to be able to be involved in helping some of these businesses and being able to just buy what they need locally. So this is just a, this is a variety store uh, called Helen's Variety that we gave a makeover to a year ago in August. And it is, it's one of the things that's amazing is how everybody works together, our pop-up shop owners, our new businesses, our new, we have a new BIA now. Um, there's this feeling of we're all in this together and we're all working to make our neighborhood a better place. And all DECA's undertaken makeovers for local businesses. These are businesses that were already in our neighborhood for eight different businesses in the last five years. That's just the most recent one, and that doesn't count the winner, Gerard Pizza, of our De DECA Gems competition. And the DECA Gems competition was a competition where we asked local people to nominate what they thought were hidden gem businesses in the neighborhood. So they might be a little rough or need a little polish, but they were businesses that we loved. And over 100 different local businesses were nominated in that competition. One of the things we've learned is how much media matters. If you can draw attention to your neighborhood and the work that's going on, it not only makes all the volunteers and all the people that live in the neighborhood feel very excited and feel very proud of what's going on in their neighborhood, but it also lets other people know from other neighborhoods and people want to come and visit you, which what Michael was saying in his presentation is what every neighborhood wants is to be somewhere that people want to come to. Like, I want to go there because they have those cool pop-up shops. Um, every year since 2012, when Marcus Westbury came, we've had consultations with our neighborhood where we just invite the whole neighborhood to come and talk about their hopes and dreams, about to help us figure out what the next steps are with the, with the project. Um, in this particular one, it was called Danforth Dreams, and 400 residents came for free beer, <laughs> free popcorn, <laughs> and to play games and to dream about our neighborhood. And um, this young woman was saying her dream was to have a pedestrian crossing across the train tracks between Woodbine and Maine. And these are just some photos. We've also been very lucky to have um, some help from academics and planners. Um, this particular one was Paul Bedford, and he had a class at U of T that was helping to study how to make how our neighborhood and how the Danforth East uh, could grow and become more vibrant. 
And that's just a learning too, is that if you're able to connect with a university or a college, there's always groups of students that are wanting to have put their, what they're learning, put their academic work towards a project that's really going to make a difference. So we've been lucky that we've had three or four different groups come and work with us and give us recommendations for how things can change in the neighborhood. The reason we know that the vacancy rate changed, for example, is because we had a group of planning students from U of T measure our vacancy rate at one point and then come back and measure it again. So we've discovered that this project, along with all the other things that are going on in the neighborhood, really can uh, do a, go a long way to ignite our, our commercial area. This is a picture of Randall and everyone in the room that knows this business that used to be there called the Renaissance Cafe. It was closed for five years before DACA's pop-up shop started. He had several different pop-up shops in his space. It was very difficult to convince him to do it, but when he did, his heart was completely in it. It still sat empty for a little while longer because he was having trouble saying goodbye to his own business, which, which he'd been running there before. And finally now, uh, a few weeks ago, a brand new business opened there, and it's a butcher and deli shop, and it just looks fantastic. And I should have, put, we should have put a picture in to show you. <laughs> So all in all, we've worked with 11 different property owners along the Danforth who own 15 storefronts, and 12 of them have been leased as a result of this project. And just a little sort of recap, we've, what the basic needs are is that we, you need a champion, at least one champion, who's going to just be the person who plans, who schemes, who brings all the other people on board. You need insurance. This is a really big, big problem because we provide, the Dan Danforth East Community Association provides liability insurance for each of our pop-up tenants because when a landlord leases a retail space, they require that of the business that they have their own liability insurance. But that would be a very big cost for a pop-up business. So we have a blanket policy that covers any pop-up shop that we put in. And this is vital to the program, and we have a, great, uh, a few great contacts in the insurance uh, area. So if you need to arrange that, we can plug you in, and of course the volunteers, because without volunteers this couldn't happen. We literally have had more than 100 volunteers involved in this project. You'll be able to find out a little bit in the next session about how the vacant unit rebate tax rebate, the vacant unit tax rebate is really a problem for us doing this work, trying to activate these empty spaces because property owners can receive a rebate of up to 30% of their property taxes if their space is, is vacant for at least 90 days out of a year. And so this can be a disincentive for them to give up that rebate if we activate it for a month or two and then they'd have to wait another 90 days to get, to get it again if they weren't successful in keeping a tenant on. So if you want to learn more about that, I advise you to go in the next session. It's something that we're working to change and um, there has been some movement, but it's a very slow process. And I think this is our last slide, um, which is just that building relationships with our city councillors, with our MPs, um, with our municipalities, with our BIA, with all of our local businesses, and them building relationships with one another, and the residents getting to know the local business owners has all been a vitally important part of making this project such a success. <laughs>